bright and sunny days at prime time video. And what a marvellous shop that was too. <laughs> it was a wonderful evening and this, this strange man came in and sat himself by the computer and was printing off guitar tabs. There used to be a video rental shop at our local high street which had an internet cafe in it as well, which I used to use, and I was printing off some guitar tabs on that. I think it was a Mastodon or it was either Mastodon or out of the drive-in. I think I was learning both of those kind of things at the time. And uh, Kevin turns out worked there. And uh, yeah, saw, saw obviously that I play guitar and asked me to join the band, and then it kind of uh, grew from there, really. And that formed the early days of Serify, which continued as the art of silence, until we decided to pretty much change it and make it our own thing. kind of grew from there really and I think we've had a good like we developed a really good understanding of working as two guitarists um, and it kind of grew from that point. started kind of coming together a bit more when uh, cause we, we initially didn't have a vocalist and Mark decided to, to drop playing bass and to move over to vocals and that was when things really started to, to come together quite well. Um, we had some fun times, good practices, got a good line up at one point, did a couple of gigs. Um, I think it just, it just phased out really, it was a bit of a shame. But yeah, it was a lot of fun playing uh, playing with that band, and um, yeah, we, we had a great time kind of writing songs and, and playing together. Tensions just ran a bit high, and it just wasn't fun anymore. And when it's not fun, there's no point. I think we all felt the same, really. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of that. What's that then? Broke it. We appear to have a slight fail. The pageant of inertia existed, um, I think, before Sarah Fye did. Um, before I'd, I'd, I'd kind of met Kevin and Mark, um, I had this kind of uh, this this thing which which I kind of considered a solo project, and I had some ideas of writing um, albums to specific subjects, uh, like concept albums, basically, and um, I'd started writing few pieces um, around some ideas I had for that, um, kind of when, when Terrify had started to happen. So it kind of got dropped for a bit and when I left I went back to some of those and really liked some of the ideas I had and I wanted to develop them further. That kind of just general kind of thought process really behind Serify of not being restricted and just playing what you feel carries over very much so in pageant but I think in pageant we're a little more free to express that. So, I, so while pageant kind of started as, as my solo project, it got to the point um, where I, I wanted it to be to be more of a band to have uh, other people, you know, putting more uh, 
putting more into it so it's not just like my project and other people play my music I want, I want it to be a collective thing and um, <coughs> we're, we're kind of at the stage where it's, that's that's beginning to happen um, Sarah Fye, uh, the previous singer um, always felt that things had to be more condensed more commercial to ch just so we could go out and get gigging and that was, that was his view um, but I suppose that I don't know whether or not it's a problem an asset or both actually, but the problem with me and Glenn is I think we do like to experiment a lot. <laughs> um, you know, the songs don't need to be a certain length and time signatures especially, you know, with, with me and Glenn have never never been normal. <laughs> we chop and change so much. It's just crazy. I mean, yeah, it's, it's always been strange. You go around someone's house and so you, it's, it's all really quite acoustic. Um, it, it's all the acoustic feel by all means. I mean, you've got um, Kevin and Ben plugged in, but I'm on a bongo or something. But then you get the, you get the rhythm, that's the main thing. And then suddenly, 10 minutes later, you realise after just a warm up jam, you've got three or four riffs that have come out of nowhere. Um, so it's, we, we've recorded it all, we listen it back and um, then we sort of pick it apart. And it's been quite good in that sense because it's, it's a more natural. Um, kind of music coming out of it, you're not really forcing a, oh this is a good riff, we'll, we'll, we'll use something with this and then we'll make something out of that. Um, it's actually a, we've, we've got the progression sort of naturally and then we just, when then we pick it apart and make play it, yeah, it's always been pretty good. The practice is uh, where we write songs because we, we'll, we'll just sort of play around with some really simple ideas sometimes and and then it, it, it's usually me, or so far it's been me who started taking them those ideas away will make a simple recording of them so I like to not forget them really but, but I'll take those one of those simple ideas and then build a song around it or, or build it into something else. Studios a few times before, and it's, it's, you get quite a confined space. They want they don't want the acoustics of the room. They want the sound for drums. Um, so doing that has always been a bit. Um, I, don't, I don't know. It's, it's been a bit man-made. So the idea of the the recording was the pseudo species EP is that I did I didn't want us to go um, into a, a standard kind of studio and get loads of really dry sounds. Um, with, with no character and then sort of add that in in post-production. I thought it would be much more interesting to go into uh, a space with really good uh, acoustics in which St John's does have um, and, and kind of experiment with you know what we could do with the sound in that space. So we, we set up mics kind of all over the room and uh, the, the most interesting one was probably um, behind the pipes in like the, the organ loft so we were getting a kind of natural reverb from those pipes and it was really nice. It's been, you, you got the drum, you record the drum, the drum's processed, there's the sound. And uh, you can get like nice sounds out of that, but then when you get the sound of the kit in the space, that's a lot better. Like when, when we use the organ chamber, you can actually hear that in the pickup and you can actually hear how drums sound through a reverb naturally. naturally. So the open space was a fantastic idea because again, it opened up that world of experimentation, different sounds and so on and so forth. Um, again, it was good because you're in that environment where everyone's jamming and you're working together and it makes it a bit nicer in that respect. Um, the downfall is um, some of those sounds aren't going to come out as you would like or expected. So that can really put a big damper on things. But I think 
to an extent we enjoyed what I feel we enjoyed the more creative side of it because while we were playing there were a couple of things we were just mucking about with again and we were like actually let's bum that in you know and that's, that was quite cool a good, good creative process in that respect The sessions were, had a lot of difficulties with them. We had some uh, some issues with the, the sound desk we were using there. Um, and, but yeah, it was, it was interesting and challenging to, to adapt to that and work around it and see what else we can do. Coming through way too loud, it's really deafening. In fact, I can't just hear me, I can hear everything. Yeah. 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 Literally, if you pick it up and put something down, I can hear it. I don't understand. Everything's just coming through at like full health. I think it did affect the end recording. I think it could have been a lot better had we, uh, you know, had we had the um, had we had the equipment that we needed and, and things like that. But, <coughs> but it was still um, it was still a great experience for us. I think it showed us um, the parts where where we're weakest as a band. Um, I, I think it's you know had, we we went into those sessions having never played the songs together even with just the three of us um, we, we'd all learnt our parts individually but but uh, I, th I think Kevin particularly feels that that it, it shows that you know it doesn't sound cohesive and things like that we know what we're playing but it's not the same as gelling together and you could definitely you can hear that it's not a completely gelled band definitely because it's not that everyone's necessarily playing their own tempo, but it's not tight. Definitely, it, it, it is different. You know, it's you listen to the EP and yeah, you can you just tell. It's hard. It's hard to describe. You can just listen to it and go, yeah, they need to be together for a bit longer. I can play live. I can um, like my way through if need be. You sort of hear the music. You play the music. Um, when the, the song's written, you've got to play it as it is, especially in sort of like serious pieces part one. Um, it's quite difficult, especially, and then you've got to really keep your time because if you've got a whole band playing behind you, if you slide out of time, you slide out of time together, so no one really notices too much. As soon as this one thing slides out of time, that's when it becomes noticed. So the timing really, was really difficult. I think we'll explore uh, re recording these songs at some point when, you know, when we've really got them now together. I think you know, he's working to quite a tight deadline with getting, getting uh, a, a recording done. So, uh, so we didn't, we weren't as prepared for it as we'd like to have been, or, or as we should have been, really. But, um, but yeah, we got some down. We spent some time together, you know, working on the band, and I think that was an important thing for us to do. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I liked sort of the whole concept of it. Um, I think it was just literally um, keeping it solid, keeping it practiced. Um, it was quite a quick turnaround in how we done it. Um, not necessarily a bad thing, but I think more time we could have we could have got a lot tighter sounds. Yes, um, it was the wow noises. It was actually the official uh, working title. I think back in the song um, songwriting sessions, because that was Kev fiddling around with his auto pan between two amps. Right, that actually was a Seraphi song. Oh, right. that was actually a Seraphi song. That was a riff I wrote for a Seraphi song. Um, that never materialised because, funnily enough, that was one of the very last ones before um, Glenn departed, so it was never used. Frank's a really good example of um, how we we kind of write songs uh, after messing around with ideas in a practice. Um, in this this one session, we'd had Kevin, you know, playing this guitar part that he'd had seen around for a long time, um, which which ended up being like the part that he plays in the verses with the, the, the kind of arpeggios and the, the chord progression that comes with that. Yeah, so it was a, I'm sorry if I'm never materialised, but, but everyone liked the riff, 
mainly I think because of the weird cow noises that stuck over the top more than anything. So he was playing that and the rest of us kind of joined in around that. Um, and I was using my eBay, which, which comes across and, and remains for me in the final version of the song. So we was playing that section and uh, this other really heavy thing was, which just a couple of minutes later we just started you know, messing around with. That, while I was, I was listening back, I the rough recordings were taken. When it came to arranging it into something crazy, I thought it would be fun to try and get both of those things in the same piece of music. So um, it was it was quite a challenge, and it was, it was a really interesting thing to do, to work out how to get from the one to the other. But keeping it still feeling like it's the same piece of music and that it's, it's kind of gone somewhere rather than just been shoved together. Um, so there's, there's this whole other section which um, is the instrumental section on the track. <laughs> to a pageant song instead, a completely different song from what it was originally, but actually I think it's one of our best. techniques that composers had used through different kind of eras of classical music and um, you know for, for the project for this I had to write a piece of music which you know showed the, the use of some of these techniques um, and I was really taken by the idea of serialism which uh, is where you take uh, each of the 12 notes of the, the chromatic scale and you use them all once um, in a, a single phrase um, and that's where the, what the baseline for Pseudo Species Part 1 is, which is why it sounds you know, pretty weird. Because uh, the first time you hear that baseline, it just sounds horrible, and you like just don't understand what's going on. And I like I like that people react to it that way. Um, but after you've heard it three or four times, it, it sounds like that it's meant to sound like that. Um, and I love playing around with music like, in that way, so uh, I thought that would be a great idea to explore. I just played around with some... Uh, some legato notes um, and just just had lots of tapping and triplets all the way through it. I thought that'd be a really fun thing to do um, with some delay on. So it just sounds it just sounds really eerie. Um, and I think that fits the kind of unsettling bass thing that's going on, especially with the the weird rhythm that you get through it. Um, such a difficult song. I mean, the serialism um, with Glenn put into it. Um, I was thinking, yeah, that's a great idea. But we'll do, that's a, yeah, well, that, that'll be easy to run with. 4-4. Four, four. Oh, and the 3-4, yeah, yeah. Oh, and double up the 4-4. Four, four. Okay. And oh, half time as well, 4-4. Four, four. So you've got to do twice more. Okay, you're not making this so easy, are you? Dan, Dan worked really hard at trying to get that right. And I'd put down ideas uh, for drums, but this was the only one where I was really quite specific about, you know, how I wanted the drums to sound because it was, it was meant to be really rigid the way that it's set out. I think it if you put another different kind of drum beat on it, it really, I don't think, would have worked. So we spent hours just trying to get the drums right for this track, 
and uh, you know I was standing there while he was trying to play along to the backing track of it, uh, kind of stamping and clapping my hands to uh, you know try and emphasise where the, the snare hits were supposed to be. And, and it was a really, it was a really frustrating afternoon, but it's it's a really hard piece to play, and you know I knew from the start that this was going to be the difficult one. Playing it live, I'm not really looking forward to, um, but no, you know, you got to go accept challenges, haven't you? When, when the time comes, I'll be able to do it. <laughs> I'm excited about playing that one live. I don't know if it's uh, as much of a crowd pleaser, but I'm not really sure any of our music is. So how do you feel about not being able to use the headphones? I'm feeling bitter, I'm feeling twisted, I'm feeling upset and cut dirty inside that I can't use proper equipment. That's right, I feel used and abused, I feel worthless, I feel like I'm being treated like pond scum. This is a travesty, I tell you, a travesty. Yeah. Choose one. It's still your fault, Kev. <laughs> in my bedroom with a group of people. Um, I think we had the drummer playing bongos. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had a guy on bass as well. And it was literally just mucking about. Just a couple of chords, again, just jamming. Pseudo Species Part 2 actually came first. We um, wrote that in uh, the way we normally do in a practice where I, what I use it was me who started playing this, the part that comes in first, the first guitar you hear. Um, until Kevin kind of put his melodic part in and, and it just kind of developed from there. Not too much work was needed, it was one foot on the bass drum, right hand, left hand, you only have to go around the kit, which, um, which was, a, it was a nice easy way to sort of introduce yourself into sort of playing it again, so we, we, we did play that one a few times just to get quite tight. Uh, well, Kevin and myself particularly are quite uh, big fans of of modern minimalist music, um, so things like Mogwai or uh, God Speak Black Emperor, Explosions of the Sky, sort of things in that area. And we've, we've kind of joked before that you know, we should just go on stage with a few kind of pre prepared uh, chord progression and just play around with them and see, see what happens. And you know, I think we could probably pull that off and that would be quite fun. You know, I'd go and watch something like that. But yeah, Pseudo Species Part 2, you know, kind of, uh, it came out of that kind of idea of just, you know, what can we do? these two chords and how long can we get away with just playing two chords um, and, and what can we do with it dynamically to make it interesting. Um, and I, I really like it for that reason I think it is just uh, you know, it's taking that minimalist approach of like it's one idea and let's do it over and over again and explore other ways of making that simple idea interesting. Um, so yeah there's, there's obviously a couple of um, a couple of changes in it which I kind of put those in just to just to kind of punctuate it almost uh, just to separate some parts out and um, to add some interest in other ways when you're kind of not expecting it to come. That that's probably my favourite album actually. I felt that musically that's the best one. Definitely. Um, but yeah again that came just from mucking about. We had a good riff. <laughs> I don't know what I was to say about it really, it's just good. It was a really simple idea that we just, I think, I think we did pretty well, I think we pulled it off well. Um, I think it's a well, uh, it's a well crafted piece of music and I'm really pleased with it. from any mistakes made on um, the recordings to actually take forwards to live gigs. If, if Pseudo Species 1 took so long, I think that's a song I've really got to work on getting it tied together. Um, so I wouldn't want to sort of run into anything like that, but then things like Crank would fall into place quite easily. Um, so yeah, a few more songs would, would always be nice. Maybe a full length album, that's uh, always welcome. There's never been a, a kind of solid lineup or any sort of consistency. It's been difficult to find someone who's 
not too busy with other stuff. You know, obviously we've all got other commitments with our time, but it's been hard to find, uh, find someone who, who can dedicate enough of their spare time to pageant of inertia. So really, it's been um, it's been quite a struggle to, to to actually build on anything. You know, not having regular practice, not having a, a full lineup. I think really our first priority going forwards is to, uh, to find a fourth member. And we've just approached someone who uh, is um, a great lead guitarist, so it's a thing, so we've got well end up with three guitarists in the band. Um, but all of us obviously can play bass as well. And I'm, I'm really into the idea of swapping around instruments and things like that. So I think it could really work out and, um, you know, hope, hopefully he's going to come on board and, uh, you know, help us to move forward a bit so we can start playing live. The pageant has never ever had a full lineup or has had a billion lineup changes. Um, the only really original member is Glenn. A full lineup, that's imperative really. We can't move forward or really write new material without a full band. That's that's such a big issue. But more importantly, and I think we all probably feel this, is nothing better than getting to that stage where we can actually go up on stage, perform to people, have people enjoy what we're playing. That's that's the biggest goal for us. That's where I want to see us. I think if we could um, get into a sort of regular rhythm of practicing and writing together, um, I think I think that'd do us good. I think you know we really enjoy getting together and playing music. We have a lot of fun doing it, and um, I just think that would be, be great for us as people to to be able to do that, to have a kind of creative outlet like that. I think we're the, the three of us are all uh, we have that kind of mindset, um, and yeah, I, th I think it. Great for all of us to do that, and, and you know, for the band, uh, if the band's going to do anything, um, you know, we'll, we'll need to we'll need to, to work towards that, um, and to have yes, yeah, some kind of regular patterns of, of things that we do, and obviously, you know, we'd love to to play live, um, to you know, to have our music heard by more people, and seeing if there's genuinely seen if there's anyone who enjoys it as much as we do because you know we write music that we enjoy um, we don't you know, even with Seraphine we didn't write it for other people and that was that was one of the tensions with Seraphine that were there where some of us felt that maybe we should write things that that people are going to like a bit more um, but, but Kevin and I particularly are I think mostly into writing what we we want to write um, and with the assumption that someone out there is going to enjoy it as well.